Well, hello. It's time for another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the fountain pens and inks I've been using throughout the week. So, let's dive into it. If videos like this interest you where I talk about fountain pens both new and old, and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And I'm just curious, have you seen the new Oppenheimer movie? I have not. So, let's dive into it. So, these are the pens I've been using this week from left to right. I have... Jinhao 100. I have a Garant Alcor. A.G. Spalding and Brothers fountain pen. A Twisby Draco. A Waterman Karen. Pilot Vanishing Point. Sorry, drew a blank there. Uh, Central Pen 1320. And a Parker. Sorry. Sorry. A Cross Townsend. We'll be using the new notebook. This uh, Cognitive Surplus Theory Notebook with the jellyfish on the cover. So my first pen is the Jinhao 100. This is one of those clones of the Parker Dual Fold. I really like the finish on this pen. There's a couple resins like this and I think this is one of my favorites. Uh, I actually, uh, a couple years ago, Aurora came out with the Aurora. They had a whole bunch of planets and one of them was the Venus and this is the color of the Venus pen, and I just thought, oh, if I was many times richer, which I'm not. Oh, and uh, so I bought a Jinhao instead. I, w I do want to point out the nib, though. It's hard to light nibs because they're shiny, but this is a Birmingham Pens nib, or sorry, Nemesign nib. Um, one of their re-entry nibs that's supposed to be hit with fire. So anyway, Jinhao 100. I want to say this is the broad nib. We'll go with broad. And I don't know if you could smell while I had the nib on drip, but this is Dea Trementis. Violet ink. Uh, Dea Trementis has this series of inks that are scented, and this one, I guess, is scented like violets. It's, you know, it smells flowery. Uh, I actually got it out because I was just curious how does this look compared to the violet that I've been using, which will be in the next pen. Uh, I like this pen. It's very comfortable to hold. It feels a lot like the Parker, but it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> so from East Germany, we have the Garant Alcor. It kind of sounds like a more expensive plastic, for whatever that's worth. Uh, the nib is a lot more exciting, even though it doesn't look like much. Uh, the ink in this one, I was going to write a nib size, but I don't know the nib size. Probably a fine. The ink in this one is Califolio Violet. And I will admit, this violet is a lot more artificial looking, and you know, your mileage may vary on the color. I'm sorry, computer screen, video recording, and all that. Uh, this one's more artificial looking. This one's more real looking. I don't know. I like this one better. So I always put a photograph of my writing sample and my pens in the video description. Actually, a link to it. So, you know, I don't know if my cell phone will do a better job or not, but we'll see. Um, you know, I'm trying to use up ink right now, so I'll probably focus on using up the Califolio Violet, but I just was curious about that. Okay, next pen I have is this A.G. Spalding and Brothers fountain pen. They still make this model, just not in the fountain pen anymore. 
kind of a unique looking pen. I'm going to guess the fountain pens didn't sell as well. I don't know a lot about A.G. Spalding and Brothers, uh, other than it's... Uh-oh. Okay, that, that shouldn't be happening. There's still plenty of ink in it. So we'll just have a little conversation with it off screen here. Twelve seconds later. It's raining outside. I thought I could do a bunch of filming today, but I guess not. As I've mentioned before, I'm really poor at drawing ampersand, so we'll call that my ampersand. Uh, this has a medium nib on it. I do remember that. It has a Lamy bronze in it. But anyway, what I was about to say is A.G. Spaulding and brothers, not sons. Um, makes a lot of luxury goods. So for a pen, that, or for a company that makes luxury goods, this is a very affordable pen. I don't know if this has anything to do with the Spalding company that makes athletic equipment or not. I couldn't figure that out. As you can tell any time you see me, I'm not exactly a fashion plate. My next pen is the Twisby Draco. Another one with a really nice finish. Not showing up the best there, but we'll just go with it. So I uh, I saw this pen and I just said, I want that. Very attractive. You know, piston filler like most Twisbees, but uh, just a just an attractive pen. I know when I first reviewed it, people told me, oh, the nib's too small for that pen. And I don't know, I guess I'm too used to vintage pens. It doesn't bother me. And I'm sorry, but not to be crude, but size doesn't matter. It's what you do with it. And it, I think it's doing very well here. Just a nice wet pen and very easy to write with. Very easy to love. I want to do a... This is one of those Survivor pens I want to do. This is the Waterman Karen. So my other one had a medium nib on it, which is actually the original nib from this pen. And uh, I was all set to film my video, and then I realized that, oh, that one had a... I forget which one, but a Deatramentis ink in it. And Deatramentis just kind of spreads out more on the paper I use for my videos. I thought, nope, we're going to do like to like. So I'm going to wait till this one's almost empty and then fill that other one with the same ink and then do my compare my uh, rodeo or no survivor pens. So this is the Waterman Karen. This one, I went and purchased a broad nib for it. And that's how I happened to have an extra Karen nib floating around the house when I saw that other one with the damaged nib. So I just said, well, we'll just do a little swap-a-doodle, and there we go. So this is Pelican Edelstein's Smoky Quartz. Is anybody getting smoke where they're at? Um, we did for a little while, but... No, well, not not so much lately. Uh, you know, you think about how awful the smoke has been some days here in the U.S., and then you just think, what must it be like in Canada where the fires are actually taking place? That's a little bit of nightmare fuel. Okay, I'm going to be doing a video on this pen, too, or at least filming it. I want to compare this one to... Uh, uh, the Majon A1, which is a similar pen that's clicky. 
so this is the pilot vanishing point. Uh, somebody helped me out last week in the comments and said that this is a 1.1 millimeter nib. So we'll go with that. And the ink in it is Rohrer and Klinger. Helianthus, which if you're looking for a yellow ink that you can actually use to write, this is one that works for that. It's dark enough that you can actually see it. Uh, this pen is one you know, it was in the let's trade it or sell it pile. Uh, but then I got talked into trying a different nib in it. Which made a world of difference. I actually enjoy it with this nib in it. With the original nib, which was steel, I was not a fan at all. Uncomfortable to hold and wasn't that great a writing. Okay, so as my kind of daily writer pen... I've been using this Centro Pen 1320, very plain pen. I think the nib just looks kind of different. Not much really to this pen, but I, it's a nice pen to write with. Plus I haven't had a pen inked up with black ink in a few weeks. I don't know what the nib size is, but the ink in it is Edelstein Onyx. I am happy to see him at the three quarter point in this bottle. So I may yet use up this bottle. Black is the color I use up the most often. But now that I'm kind of focusing my efforts on specific colors, I have been finding I'm getting rid of bottles of ink, actually. Not quickly, but I am getting rid of bottles of ink. So, making progress. Uh, some people ask, why is that my goal? Um, mostly because I want to have less ink. As I'm going to mention later, I really want to just have less stuff around. Okay, this is the uh, Ferrari, I'm sorry, the Parker, jeez, I did it again. The Cross Townsend uh, Special Ferrari Edition. Yeah, that's Ferrari, isn't it? I was reading an article this week about, I'm pretty sure it was Ferrari. Let me just double check so I don't make a fool of myself. Okay, so I was reading an article this week. I, I didn't find the article I was looking for, but I found one just like it. Uh, about, there was a, a guy who used to be a singer. I don't know, maybe he still sings. Justin Bieber. But anyway, he owned a Ferrari. And then he, uh, he customized it and then auctioned it off. Um, let's see. Let me make sure I know what I'm talking about here. All right, so one of the things he did is he modified his pen. Uh, he changed the, or sorry, his, yeah, he, he does not own a, a Cross Townsend. Uh, he, he modified his car uh, with custom fender flares, a splitter, a wing, stuff on the inside, new rims, a subwoofer. Wow, that's exciting. Um Ferrari, I guess, is okay with that, but only at their approved shops. And that wasn't one of their approved shops. And then, uh, oh, they have some clauses about not selling the car. Um, which he, I guess he auctioned it off. Yeah, for he auctioned it for $434,500. Eh, anyway, they, they have a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to have to edit out my whole looking this up thing but anyway he 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 is now barred from buying another ferrari because they're very particular about it so i just thought that was kind of funny uh that some big hollywood or i don't know if he's still big but some big hollywood star 
is banned from owning another Ferrari. So my Ferrari is much cheaper than his. It's a Cross Townsend. And the ink in it is De Atramentis. Apple Blossom. And I'll be honest, you know, the, you'll see it if you open the article. You look at that car and I'm just like, eh. If I were rich, would I get a Ferrari? Probably not. I don't really want a high performance car, at least not that kind of performance. Um, I wouldn't mind a newer Toyota Camry. Maybe even a Lexus if I were rich. But pretty much I want just a plain ordinary sedan that doesn't stick out anywhere. And is reliable. So anyway, those are the pens and inks I've been using this week. Uh, two scented inks, which is different for me. This one I'm trying to use up because I have Matahari's Cordial in the same color and I like it better. Uh, this one I'll probably focus on the Califolio. And, uh, yeah, the, the only, well, pro I don't know if there's any of these real particularly close to getting used up, so it might be a while. But I've got some other colors I'm trying to use up, so I kind of cycle around them so you and I don't get bored. So anyway, I will talk a little bit, and, uh, I won't mention the Ferrari thing because I already filmed that part, but I will put a link to the Ferrari story in the video description. So, um, I apologize. I missed last week. I was sick, and when you get sick in the summer, it's just like the worst. Plus, it was a really hot week, and it was just miserable. <laughs> so, I wasn't up to doing anything, but feel much better now. So, first thing I wanted to mention, I have... Uh, a Q&A video that I plan to do. I saw there are a couple questions in it already. So I'm going to try starting to do some filming, just make some clips and make a little library of clips on my laptop. Um, edit it together probably around the holidays. So if you have a question you want to ask me, and uh, feel free. You'll see the link down in my video description. Uh, second thing I wanted to mention, oh, let me get out of here. So I read a book recently. I actually, that's one of the few things I accomplished when I wasn't feeling so horribly sick. Seems like when you're really sick, you just don't accomplish anything. Because, you know, you think, oh, I'm, I've got this day off from school because I'm so too sick to go. Maybe I'll correct. No, you know, when I'm, when I'm sick enough to call into work, I don't accomplish anything I sit and put on a movie, <laughs> sleep a lot. Um, I got horribly, horribly sick several years ago, missed uh, multiple days in a row of work, and I spent the whole time uh, streaming Futurama. <laughs> now every time I hear the theme song for Futurama, I just remember how sick I was during that time. <laughs> oh, which is sad, because I hear Futurama's back, but... Anyway, um, so I'm going to try something different. Oops, get it in front of the camera. Here with, uh, I'm going to do a book review of Revolution Space, Alistair Reynolds' book. And I decided to try doing it using a concept map. I don't know how well that's going to go. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to film the talking part today, actually. And then uh, we'll fi I'll uh, film the concept map. I don't know, probably tomorrow, because I'm going to work in the garden for a while and work in my class for a while and then do this for relaxation. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to try that, so I'll be curious, and I'll mention it again when I film the video. Let's just see what you think. Uh, I did it during uh, one of my live streams, and it since the live stream was about pen pals, it was kind of nice to have some visuals. The camera I use for live streams is this monstrosity. It... Uh, you know, flips up like this to get my face, flips down to get the document. And there's a button here so I can turn it around. It has a light on it. It's actually designed to be a document camera, but anyway, that's what I use for live streams. That's how I can get the... Uh, sorry. That's how I can get the me talking and the writing in the same live stream, because I don't 
have the ability to do a multi-camera setup. I don't have multiple webcams or anything like that. So that's what I use. So I'm, well, anyway, we'll try that or something during the book review. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but it has been raining all day. Uh, started last night. So I need to go out and weed my garden, but the garden's a big mud hole right now. Plus, well, I guess it's just dripping right now. But anyway, it seemed like a good day to film a bunch of the me talking videos as well as this pens and use so i'm i'm batch filming uh what's the rest of my time oh so two weeks ago i talked about cleaning up and i thought you know maybe i should look at it like i'm moving so i started looking at my books first because that i know marie kondo wouldn't tell you to start with books but uh it just seemed like an easy target. And I just went through my bookshelves and say, what's a book I'm never going to read again? And what are some books that I'm honestly never going to read? And uh, I have about one shelf of that worth stacked here on the living room floor, uh, ready to be either you know taken to a used bookstore or donated to the library. So that felt like progress. I, I actually have quite a stack in the... Okay, air conditioner's off. Because it's cool, I don't know why it's making that noise. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know if the microphone picked it up. But anyway, what was I talking about? Books. So I, start, I decided to start with books. Um, we'll work through other things. I actually am not a clothes hoarder. Um... I have no need to look at my clothes and say, oh, what, what do I like and what don't I like? Because uh, I wear what I have, except for, like, I've got a, a nice jacket I can wear when I really, really, really need to dress up for, like, a job interview or something. So, uh, yeah, I uh, actually did a lot of reorganizing on clothes a few years ago. Uh, but I... I there's some, there's just random clutter around and just random objects. Like I'm, I've got a, you can't see it, but I've got a coffee table here. I kind of filled with things that I want to sort. So, but uh, anyway, I, when I mentioned that two weeks ago, a few people brought up a, another interesting idea called Swedish death cleaning. You know, what if I'm filming pens and use and then bam, I'm dead. <laughs> um, I don't want people to have to deal with all my stuff. You know, what do I want to leave behind for people? Do I want them just to be like, oh my gosh, he has so much stuff. This is going to take forever. This is horrible. Or do I want it to be a relatively painless process where I've realized that, you know, I don't need to keep this. So, uh, and, and, you know, and I, the way I interpret Swedish death cleaning, it is not cleaning to be minimalist and give up your lifestyle just to make it easier on the people after you, but to actually have that thought of the people cleaning up after you and what do they do? Uh, things like, you know, having passwords for your electronic devices available and, um, you know, not having an excessive amount of junk. Because uh, it, it is easy to have junk. That's why I talked about moving. I, I think I was less grim than the Swedish people are because I called it cleaning like you're moving, <laughs> not cleaning for the, for the dead. But you know, it makes me think of a lady who I used to work with. She had taught, I don't know, she started teaching, I think in the late 60s, and she retired, uh, well, it's probably been a decade now. But she retired and... Uh, one of her goals when she retired, well, one of her goals was last day of school, she's done. <laughs> she was not going to come back the next week and clean out her classroom like a lot of retiring teachers do. She wanted to turn in her keys on the last day of school and see ya. <laughs> but the other thing, she wanted to make sure she didn't leave a lot of junk for the next teacher that followed her. So she spent all of her last year just throwing things away. You know, old textbooks... You know, she had some really old, outdated graphing calculators. You know, they had a new set of TI-83s, so why keep the old TI-81s and so on? So, anyway, she, she threw away a lot, a lot, a lot of junk. And what she did leave, she made sure it was very organized. 
Because, yeah, you may look at that shelf of books and think, oh, look at all these resources. And take it from me as somebody who has inherited several classrooms with the previous person's junk left behind. A lot of it, you're just like, what's that for? And you never use it. So uh, I, I know uh, that's my plan when I retire is to make sure I leave nothing behind. And I like her goal of last day of school, see ya! <laughs> I don't want to be one of those that's in there ret uh, cleaning up forever. I actually, I, dealt, I uh, worked with one lady. She was in there starting in the next school year still cleaning out her stuff. And the superintendent finally took, pulled her aside and said, you've got a week. Because <laughs> she just was dragging it out. I, I think it, part of it was it was just hard for her to leave a job she had done for so many years. But anyway, so that was uh, my long way of saying I appreciated what I heard about uh, uh, the Swedish death cleaning and the other comments on decluttering. And that's something, you know, I'm not a hoarder or anything, but I... I'm more cluttery than I should be. It's just my fantasy is I live in a place where it looks like a motel where every surface is clear. Everything is put away. Nothing is out except the thing you're using right now. That's not how real people actually live. I'm sure there are some. I, I, I work with a lady who's kind of like that. But, you know, that's not how most of us are. We have stuff and uh, it's out. But I try to keep this desk clean, and that table is usually cleaner. I, I don't want you to see my couch either. Well, you, I guess you can see the... Oh, no. You can just barely see the top of it. I'm glad you can't see the seating area right now. I finally realized I need a printer and bought one, and now I'm like, oh, shit, where am I... Sorry, I mean, oh, shoot, where am I going to put this thing? So, uh, yeah, I'm working on that. I, I have an idea, I just, anyway, you don't care. Um, but yeah, I've got some stuff there, and I cleaned off, I, I have some storage bins I use as an end table that I cover with a tablecloth, and I cleaned a lot of stuff out of there, and then the tablecloth is laying on the couch. What else is there? Oh, I'm going to change this shirt several times, so I have three other shirts laying there. I'm going to change it so... You know, the videos look like I'm wearing different shirts, so they're filmed on different days. But uh, they'll get hung back up in the closet after I'm done with this. So I guess that's not clutter, really. That's in use. <laughs> Just like praying nobody knocks on the door right now. <laughs> All right. In other, the other exciting thing, I wanted to just mention um, the movie uh, Oppenheimer came out. I don't know if the theater in my little town will ever get Oppenheimer. Uh, I hear it's doing okay in the theaters, but I, I don't know if it'll ever get here. You know, you know they, they, they do one movie a week, so they want to make sure they get as many people interested in watching it as possible. And that may not be a movie that appeals to the masses. I haven't seen it. I'm curious. Uh, I may do what I usually do, which is just to wait till it comes out on video. Uh, I don't, unless, like I said, I'm sick, I don't usually watch a whole movie the whole way through in one sitting. I'm more of a, oh, I'll watch part of it tonight, part of it tomorrow night. And if it's a long, like, Lord of the Rings epic, I might do three nights on it or something. Um, I can sit for hours reading a book, but I, I, I don't know, there's something about movies that I start to get antsy. But anyway, I am curious to see it in the theaters. Uh, I'm curious about the historical accuracy and the scientific accuracy. And, you know, if you hit too far into the science part, I also know that everybody's minds just shut down their doors. Unless they're a physics nerd like me. Because, yeah, my original degree is in physics. So, uh, but I'm curious what people think about it. So, you know, let me know down in the comments if you've seen it, if it's worth seeing. And is it worth seeing in a theater? And no... My little town of 1,500 people does not have an IMAX theater. I have heard that it's optimized for IMAX. I don't even know if there's an IMAX theater in North Dakota. I guess I've never checked. Uh, I did see Dune in the theater when it first came out, but that was the first time in a long time I'd seen a movie in a theater. 
And even on a date or something, that's just not something I usually think of as, oh, let's go to a movie. So I'm curious, but it did make me think, back in college, I read a book, and I'm going to intersperse this because I'm going to do some close-up footage that I'll, I'll film separately. So I'm going to try to not have my content overlap. But I read a book in college. It was called Heisenberg's War. It's by Thomas Powers. And uh, the reason I read it, well, actually, the reason I read it is just we'd been studying quantum physics, and I was just curious, and then I saw this book in the bookstore, because my college town had a bookstore back then. doesn't anymore. And uh, I just decided, huh, I know that name. So I bought the book and was curious. And he was in charge of the German project during the Second World War to build the atomic bomb. And uh, so I'll flip over to the down-camera footage to talk about that book. So I forgot to record this earlier, uh, so I'm adding it, adding in it, ha, adding it in now. So this is Heisenberg's War by Thomas Powers. Let's get up a little higher so you can actually see the book. Sorry for the lighting. We're on my document camera now because I didn't want to set everything else up again. Uh, Heisenberg's War by Thomas Powers, The Secret History of the German Bomb. You know, it's a, a thick book. It's got lots of footnotes at the end. Um, some pictures of different people. Well, anyway, um, the, the whole thing, the whole book is about, and, and the author is... Well, actually, it doesn't say what the author's qualifications are. The whole premise, it's a lot of biography, but then at the end, he uh, gets into this hypothesis. <laughs> I mean, maybe we don't even give it that much, but uh, the idea that Heisenberg may have actually sabotaged the German atomic bomb project, possibly intentionally, possibly just because he was incompetent at leading something like that. And we'll never know. But uh, as I'm going to mention with some of the other books, there's definitely <laughs> signs that it was not intentional. But anyway, an interesting read, an interesting idea. Um, I need to reread it. I read this in college and uh, should reread it. There's a... Uh, Anyway, some interesting story to the whole thing. Okay, so your, your mileage may vary on that. You know, at the time I was quite taken in by Thomas Powers' argument, but in the years since then I'm a little less, well, I'm a lot less sure. Um, but I was taking a class called History of World War I and World War II, so that book fit in perfectly. And I, re I found another book, which I later bought, called Uncertainty. The Life and Science of Werner Heisenberg by David Cassidy. And so that was a also a useful resource and definitely did not take the same tack as Thomas Powers, but left the idea open, let's just say. So we'll go down camera again and take a closer look. Uh, David Cassidy wrote Uncertainty, The Life and Science of Werner Heisenberg. This is more of a straightforward biography. Uh, says he's devoted much of his academic career to Heisenberg, modern German science, and the study of the development of quantum mechanics. Uh, he received his PhD in the history of science from Purdue University and is associate professor at Hofstra University at Long Island, New York. But anyway, this is, oh, there's a little dust on it. Uh, this is more of a straightforward biography. Again, <laughs> very dense. Um, yeah, and there's some pictures in it, you know, black and white, because, you know, think about the time it was. But, uh, again, he doesn't get as much into the whole idea that Heisenberg may have helped prevent the Germans from getting the nuclear bomb. He, he, he addresses it a little bit, some of the controversy around it, but... Uh, less supposition, let's say. But again, quite a thick bibliography. So, an interesting read. When Oppenheimer came out, I started thinking about all this, and you know, I just thought... I went on the internet, and I found out that uh, David Cassidy wrote 
when, once some more information got declassified, he wrote uh, Beyond Uncertainty, Heisenberg, Quantum Physics, and the Bomb. And uh, what, what it says on the back here, um, an excellent follow-up on Cassidy's earlier masterwork, Uncertainty, which is out of print, by the way. Cassidy offers deep insight into Heisenberg's role as a principal founder of quantum mechanics and as the leading German physicist during the World War II years in the quest for atomic energy and weapons. Uh, that's not the part I wanted to read. Oh, here we go. In the, on the front cover here, it says, Since the fall of the Soviet Union, long-suppressed information has emerged on Heisenberg's role in the Sorry, I'll just tap my camera here to help it stay awake. <laughs> Heisenberg's role in the Nazi atomic bomb project. In Beyond Uncertainty, Cassidy interprets this and other previously unknown material within the context of his vast research and tackles the vexing questions of a scientist's personal responsibility and guilt when serving an abhorrent military regime. A complex portrait of a remarkable man caught up in tremendous historical and intellectual ferment. Beyond Uncertainty is Science Biography at its Finest. So, I am curious to read that. So, I uh, that's on my list, hopefully, yet this summer. Uh, the sequel that recently came out, well, in 2009, so I just didn't realize about it until recently. But, you know, Beyond Uncertainty, also by David Cassidy. And this is, I, I can't say as much about this. But it does say that since the fall of the Soviet Union, long suppressed information has come out on uh, Heisenberg's role in the Nazi atomic bomb project. So it talks about how he's going to interpret that. So I'm, who knows, I may have to read the end of this first uh, just to find out. <laughs> I am curious. So this may have to be a book review soon. And then it got me thinking of a book that I didn't read it back then in college because uh, I didn't have time and then it just sat on my shelf. But, you know, I had pulled some references out of it for my paper that I wrote. Um, it's called Brighter Than a Thousand Suns by Robert Young. And let's see what the copyright is. Copyright 1956. So it was written not too long after it. And it starts kind of in the 1920s and ends sort of in the late 40s, early 50s, and just follows a lot of the people, personalities, discoveries, and so on that were involved in it. So I want to fully read that, and I'm hoping I can read these two books. I'm, I'm finishing up a book right now that's just science fiction, and, uh, but I've got these two on my list yet to read this summer, so... And the last book, I don't have a cover for it, but it's Brighter Than a Thousand Suns by Robert Young. Um, published in 1956. And again, oh, actually not quite as extensive a bi bibliography. But index. A lot of appendices. I'm not seeing the footnotes. Hmm. That's a little different from uh, how things are done now. But it is worth noting that this being written in 1956, he was able to get a lot more uh, uh, direct references and uh, first-hand interviews and such, so that may be why. But it's a very dense book that covers... No, quite a long period. It covers from 1918. It calls 1923 to 1932 the beautiful years, and yeah. <laughs> and then uh, on up through 1955. So this is another one I'm really curious to read. I, I bought it way back, and, uh, you know, I was in college then, and I just didn't have time, and I find myself... <laughs> How many years late? How many decades later? And thinking, wait, I need to read that thing. So I'm going to read this. Anyway, we may be talking about all these, and I may have to reread this one and the, the other David Cassidy one. Now, I just want to mention 
I do have a few other links down below. So one of the thing, links I have is a story of a professor who grew up, I want to say in South Dakota, but he ended up working on the nuclear bomb project at Los Alamos. And then he went on to a fairly successful career just over the river from Fargo in uh, Moorhead, Minnesota, at Concordia. Um, I can't remember if it's Concordia College or Co Concordia University. Anyway, it's a it's a private college that's in uh, Moorhead, Minnesota, and uh, so I've I've got a lot of I've got an interview with him, and then I remembered some movies I've watched over the year. One of them was Day One, which was a made-for-TV movie, but very heavily researched. Um, You'll recognize a lot of the actors. David Strathern plays uh, Oppenheimer. I was really surprised when I was watching um, um, The Expanse and thought, I know that guy. And I finally figured out I knew him from this movie day one when he was way, way young. I'm trying to remember the name of the character now. Okay, David Strathern plays uh, Commander Clays Ashford in uh, The Expanse. So anyway, I, it was just, I know this guy. Where do I know him from? And it turned out it was from this movie from way, way back. And I'm sure he's been in other stuff. I just, that's the one that caught my eye. So anyway, day one, um, nothing real creative about it. I'm just getting back to my notes to remember everything I wanted to say. Nothing real creative about it. Um, Brian Dennehy plays uh, General Groves. Um, Probably closer to the size of the real General Groves than Matt Damon in Oppenheimer. Um, but, you know, that was an interesting... It's interesting. It's available on DVD only at the moment. So, I have a DVD player I can plug into my computer, so I guess I can use that. And then the other one I that I thought of was the movie Fat Man and Little Boy, which was about more focused on the relationship between General Groves and Robert Oppenheimer. I had Paul Newman as as uh, General Groves, which is definitely far from how the real General Groves looked. And, uh, okay, no wonder I didn't remember who it was. Dwight Schultz. Nothing I really recognize. Oh, Heart to Heart. That was an old 70s show. They must have made a movie about it. Star Trek First Contact. Yeah. So, anyway, apparently not in anything that I've watched. <laughs> Nothing against that. He's apparently had a very solid career. Uh, but anyway, that one, I didn't care for that one as well. It, it seemed to be researched. They spent a lot more time on, there There was some uh, accidents where a scientist got exposed to radiation and died of radiation poisoning and they got into the nice version of how god-awful it is to die that way. Sorry, I'm touching my camera again because I don't want it to be naughty. Actually, I can only run this half an hour at a time, so I'm going to quick hit stop and then restart it, and then we'll talk about the rest. Okay, so the other thing I wrote down, I've got two links down there. It's under, it's under a section called Kathy Loves Physics and History. That's actually a YouTube channel. What she likes to do is she explores physics topics and the personalities and research behind them up through, I want to say, 1956. And uh, she is very detailed. And uh, so she actually explored the whole Heisenberg thing and actually explored several of the other scientists who are around all that. Um, and so I linked to her, to her two videos on Heisenberg and honestly, <laughs> he doesn't come off looking so great in her videos. Um, more of an opportunist and, uh, maybe a little bit incompetent and, you know, in, and in some ways just desperately trying to survive in a regime that was originally hostile to modern physics. Uh, there were people that you know, I actually thought this was Jewish physics. And, uh, anyway, he, he, uh, may have been a bit of an opportunist. So I don't, the thing is, we don't know. There's nothing definitive out there. Uh, I, I think the real way to look at the whole Heisenberg question is, what would you have done in that situation? I know what we all like to think we would do, 
But that's not always what we would really do in those situations. And until you live in a situation like that, you honestly don't know. So I think uh, Kathy Love's Physics and History illustrated that very well and researched it very thoroughly. Uh, and I think pretty well put to bed the whole idea. Oh, piece of paper. Pretty well put to bed the whole idea that Heisenberg might be some kind of a hero. So he was just a complicated man living in a complicated time. So anyway, um, those are the pens and inks I've been using this week. Uh, well, thank you for watching. <laughs> And if videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens both new and old and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And I'm curious, uh, have you seen Oppenheimer? Do you plan to? If you have seen it, what did you think? Is it worth it for me to go watch it or should I just wait till it comes out on video? Uh, and, you know, do you know more about this Heisenberg thing that you could add? Um, I, I would be curious. So let us know that down in the comments as well. So anyway, I want to thank you for watching. And I'm going to find some kind of rain driving footage to send you out with. So we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.